uh, school board and facilities committee meeting. And I don't know, does everybody kind of know everybody? Because I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Who is this visitor over here? I'm a resident of Oxway. My name is Celia Diamond. I, I have one grandchild who's a graduate of the Yellow Spring Schools, and two of them are in the high school. Cool. Thank you. Do you want to introduce yourself just so we know who you are? My name is Lori Sparrow now. Oh, hi. I'm, hi. I'm the theater teacher at Yellow Springs High School in McKinney, and a uh, choir teacher and stagecrafts teacher. And I would like to, when we have some public comment, address the committee if possible. Yeah, yeah, thank you. All right, so tonight um, we started out with an agenda which has been changed. Uh, it has been narrowed down basically um, for votes engineering, Michael Murdoch to present on the maintenance plan uh, reports, we'll call it for the time being. Um, and you'll find on your table there is uh, kind of um, two written reports, and then there's this database. And the database is very tiny, uh, but um, Michael will be going over that with us, and there's two reports uh, they did have on them, which one was Mills Lawn School, which one was uh, Middle High School. So uh, we'll help you figure out which one you have if it's not marked. It is marked. Are they all marked yeah. down there? Okay. Um, what Let's mark them, sir. The bottom. The, which spreadsheet is which? And the one yeah. with the chart at the bottom is the Middle School, school High School. High school. So uh, I'm going to work on putting this, uploading this as a read only. Um, we just did a trial and it, it's not working right now because it still allows folks to opt out of read only. And uh, I don't want folks going in and changing it. Oh. So you just got to bear with me a little bit. Okay. Uh, one of the things we've taken off the agenda, um, Mike Bruchley, who's with uh, Bruchley Architects, we had put a, a, a little report in the documents for tonight. Of, about square footage. We're not going to discuss that at all tonight. Uh, we're going to hold that until we follow. So we're going to stick to these reports primarily. And um, we are visiting schools tomorrow, and we're visiting more schools next Friday. We'll talk about that. So, uh, Michael Murdoch, take the floor. Okay, um, thank you. Which report do you, what do you want to start with? You want to start with, with um, the high school? Sure. <clears throat> so um, this is a, uh, a summary of, of what we're going to do, we do with the PowerPoint or we do the report? Well, you, you want to do the report or the PowerPoint? Let's do the PowerPoint. Okay. okay. It's, it's a summary that? of the report. We, there's more it's detail in there. the PowerPoint and obviously more detail. It's, in, it's in there. Okay. Um, yep. school first, then Mills Lawn, and then um, review the database. And uh, I want to talk through some of the assumptions I made, um, the accuracy of the information. There are some missing, I'd like to talk about missing fields, information that you want that's not in there. I can, you know, see how, how complicated. I do owe you some estimates of new work, um, and there's some things I'm going to add to it that I already know I'm going to add. Plus, we have all of the structural, architectural um, envelope information still to come from the structural engineer. And I haven't got that yet, so. And will that include the roof? Yes, it will include the roof, the <coughs> windows, the doors, uh, the exterior brick and whatever exterior materials, uh, sidewalks, uh, access points. Um, uh, there's a few other things on there, I think, as well. So we can review that. I can go back and look at their proposals. So go ahead. Next slide. So we're going to kind of go through this in the same order that the report was done. And uh, I don't know. Do you take questions or do we? Do we? How do you well, want? To? If people have questions along the way, right. I think you will take them. Okay. Right so we're not. So we can. Wait. 
Okay. Not just high level, this is all high level, we can get into any details. But your buildings don't have fire protection or sprinklers uh, today. It does not require, if you do a major renovation, it's going to be required. Um, there might be a way for Mike to design it or an architect to design it so you have a limited amount of sprinklers or, or none, but it makes it's very difficult to do. The jurisdictions want sprinklers. So um, you're, we're assuming about three dollars a square foot for sprinkler system. Um, yeah, I think your uh, the, your high school is about seventy five thousand square feet. I think is the number I got. So a little less than that. So I just used seventy five thousand square feet. So it's about a two hundred twenty five thousand dollars expense to put sprinklers in a building that size. Um, your water supply that you have to the high school right now would not be adequate for water, uh, domestic water and sprinklers. So they're going to require a larger tap. I think you have a two inch tap, you're going to probably have to go to a, a three and a half or four inch. I just threw a number in there of 25 to $30,000. That's the tap fee in Hamilton County. I have no idea what the tap fee is here, but it's probably close to that. Um, you make it a bet, you make it a uh, a rebate for your two inch, but uh, that's in the range of what they're going to. Um, I don't know what the water pressure is here. Uh, that's probably a next step or a step you, you need to take. Uh, if you have good water pressure, it's a one story building or I guess a three story building in, in one location, you may not need a pump. If you don't have good water pressure, you're going to need a pump. Uh, a pump package, which is the fire pump and then the controller. Um, is 50 to 60,000, 65,000. Um, not cheap, but that's a requirement if you don't have enough water pressure. And the other thing you're going to need is a meter pit. Uh, a meter pit, the, the jurisdictions having authority will have one, will, will require that one line come from your water main, whether it's a three inch or four inch, and then it'll go into this concrete meter pit, this concrete box that's uh, below grade and there will be a, a Y, and you'll have the domestic branch off as one, and the fire protection branch off as another, and it's got to be in this protected locked box so that nobody tampers with it. It's got to be monitored, so your fire alarm system got to run a little wire out there to monitor the, the valves to make sure nobody tampers with it and closes the valves. It's got to be heated. It's got to have a drain. It's pain in the butt. It's about uh, 75 to 100,000 bucks. So that's a, a meter bit, and they're they're uh, generally required. So sprinklers is going to uh, the the Yellow Springs High School and uh, McKinney Middle School sprinkler system. Worst case is 420,000. Best case, if your water pressure is good, it's going to be the cost of the installation plus a meter. Bit. So uh, plumbing. Um, can you shrink it a little bit? It's a little wrong. I don't know if it was like. So the existing water service that you have um, is original. It's in the ground. It, um, you know, it's old. Uh, water mains freeze in the winter, and when they freeze, they're expensive to repair. You got to dig it all up. Um, you know, we're recommending that you replace that uh, service in five years. You could probably go another 20. It's it's, but when it fails, it's going to fail, and it usually fail in the winter. And when it fails, you're out of business. The school's closed. You're not, and you're going to pay somebody a lot of money to replace it uh, at an emergency kind of situation. So, you know, um, you're not going to get 100 years out of it. You're going to get, you know, 60 to 70. At some point, it probably needs to be um, replaced. Your sanitary. In storm systems, as far as we can tell, the existing the original systems are cast iron. Um, I don't think they're tile. I don't think they're um, uh, anything other than cast iron. The new building or the most recent additions uh, on the drawings, we saw PVC, so um, that's good. But the old systems are cast iron. Cast iron is great, but it you know sewer gases coming back from the main uh, affect it, and over time they'll collapse. So, you know, it could be in pristine condition. The other thing ha that happens in it is it corrodes. It's iron, it corrodes. And so you get all these kites and all these other things that make water, waste, uh, rainwater, et cetera, uh, hampers their ability to flow through it. So 
what we would recommend is that you hire a plumbing contractor to camera the system. Um, I put in a number of $5,000 to $7,500 uh, for both the sanitary and the storm. Um, they would you know, take a, a floor plan or a set of drawings, or if they don't, they draw it on a, on a piece of paper, and they'd identify um, for you where, they're, where they put the camera in, and they videotape it, and then you have the videotape. The videotape that will tell you the condition of your pipe. And a, a person that runs that system, if they've got uh, the right skills, they can look at it and determine whether the pipe's uh, in acceptable condition or it's going to fail. And cast iron typically fails across the top of the pipe. So if you're looking at the pipe, the 12 o'clock position is where it typically fails. And it fails there because the sewer gas accumulation eats through the, the pipe and then the weight of the soil pushes down upon it and it collapses. So it's kind of the worst place it can fail and that's where it fails. And so very quickly it fills up with dirt or sand or whatever it is around the pipe and then you have nothing. So there are some things you can do to uh, if the pipe's in good condition, there are some things you can do to the, to the sewer uh, and the storm to, to extend its life. Um, there's some um, liners that you can put in, there's spray liners, there's um, inserts, there's all kinds of things that if, if you, the sewer's in good shape, it might be worth it. If the sewer line is in poor shape, they're not going to be able to do it. It'll, it would fail when they installed the system, so it wouldn't work. Um, so anyway, that's like a good cast iron system that's in pristine shape might go 100 years. I've seen 100-year-old pipe come out of the ground. It looks pretty good. And of course, I've seen 50-year-old pipe collapse. So it's, it's a, you know, the only way to really know is by camera. And they'll go down to the, from the roof, they'll go down the roof trains, they'll go in as far as they can go. The camera's not, um, I think, it, you know, anything smaller than two inches, it probably would get stuck. So. Um, but it's pretty good. You, you can get a good sense of what you have. Um, storm system, we also think, is cast iron. Um, there does appear, when we looked around and, and took photos and, and we're on the roof, it does appear there are um, what I would call debris rings around some of the uh, floor drains and roof drains that would indicate that the roof drain wasn't working or it was working slowly and that debris built up in the puddle of water and as it drained out, that debris settled. So that's kind of a telltale sign that you have a slow drain. So we did see some of that. The roof drains uh, are uh, a victim of the granular material that's on the roof uh, that's you know coming loose. It gets washed into the roof drain. It sits down at the bottom of that trap up there at the bottom of the roof drain and accumulates. And uh, I imagine that's what's in there is the granular material. Also, a lot of the roof Strain strainers have uh, corroded. Uh, we can get into that in a little bit, but they've corroded and they're not functioning as a, a means of keeping debris out. So you might have sticks and leaves and stuff into the roof drain and it's now sitting at the bottom of that roof drain and it needs to be cleaned out. There's really only a couple of ways to clean that out. Jetting is <clears throat> by far the most popular and most effective but it's also destructive. If you have a weak pipe and you run a jet in there, then the jetting's water. It's just essentially high pressure water. You run a jet in there and the pipe's in poor shape, you can break the pipe. So you do cause more damage um, if you jet it. So I would definitely camera first. If you have debris, um, and again, if you, you know, if you find the right plumber, he will help you figure out how to clean it. Sometimes there's clean outs. He can go into a clean out and clean it out without jetting it. If the, if the Cast iron's fragile, you don't want to jet it. There's other ways to do it. But jetting, like I said, is by far the most effective if we need to Tip, can I interrupt for a second? Sure. Um, so, back when I was still working, um, we, of course, I'd have to go up on the roof periodically to, to look at the drains, yeah. do things with them. Generally, it was the baskets that were stopped up. Yes. Not the, the drain itself. Right. So once I cleared that away, the water would flow and it would be fine. So. I, but, you know, I wouldn't be totally convinced that we have any problem with the piping. It's mostly with the baskets and the, the drain. Well, there's a lot of baskets that are so corroded or, or they're, they're not effective anymore as a basket. Yeah. I don't know. It may be clear. I, the debris ring gave me uh, a concern. Yeah. It may be perfectly clear. It may not be. I don't know. But the corroded 
uh, debris baskets or strainers um, caused me to have some alarm. So, and some of them have been kind of knocked off where they should be. And, yeah. And it, it's a it's a it's a catch twenty two. You get too much over there, you wet. You know, you get a flood. If you get you know the baskets too too good, you get a flood, and that's worse. Overweighting the anyway. Um, was I done with that? Was that all the okay? Um, so there you go, roof drains, there are roof drains. Um, is there, there seems to be some roof drains that have been recently repaired. Yeah. And you've cut through the roof and you get down to the, you've gotten down to the deck or the metal and replaced that? Yes. Okay, and the bowl, the bowl get also gets replaced. The, thing that the whole thing gets replaced if, you know, usually that would happen when, we're, when we have a roofing project like this. Yeah. Yeah, and then the roofers come and look at it and say, hey, we have to do something with this. Because yeah. it's, and that was one of my questions, is there a roofing project, but probably you're waiting for me to answer that question, right? So That would be correct. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, I assume that as soon as I wrote that down there. So anyway, the, if you do have a roof project, I would recommend you replace all of the roof drains. I mean, they're 50, 60 years old or time. It's, that's a good long run for a roof drain. So replace them. You can, there's, there's some uh, non metal metallic ones that would last you know forever but uh, that is something I think that needs to be looked at urinals I mean you guys urinals last forever there's really nothing you can uh, do to unless somebody breaks it um, the waterless urinals I know that's a great appeal everybody loves the waterless urinals but they are terrible with cast iron and they will destroy the cast iron faster than it the only thing you can pour down the drain that would be worse is soda like Coca-Cola or soda, any any acid destroys the roof drain, so or the, the cast iron. So um, I understand that if you if you have a PVC system, <laughs> waterless is fine. That's the only way I would ever spec a waterless urinal is if you have a PVC system. If you have a cast iron system, it's doing damage to the cast iron. I'm sorry to tell you that because I you know I like waterless and smelly a little bit, but other than that, I think it's a good idea. Um, so that's a concern we have. The toilets, again, I would just ask that you settle on a standard flush, uh, low flush model and a low flush valve. There's tanks, there's tankless, there's a number of different toilets. And I understand this is, a, this is a process of 50, 60 years you've had toilet replacements. And, um, so it's not, not a big deal. Handicap, I'm sorry. I do, I do have a question about that because in your report, you say that most toilets in both buildings were not Flush model, but we well, not easy. right. So a toilet um, so made in the '60s yeah. is anticipating a certain amount of water to flush yeah. the yeah, no, no, I, whatever that. So you say that they are not compatible. Right. A low flush valve won't work on an old toilet. So, so you have to put the high flush valve, or you have to replace the bowl. That's what you were saying. Right. And I think something that I wanted to insert in that is that in this community, water costs twice as much as. And so does your electricity. Yes. It's very expensive. Yes. <laughs> and so that is something that I would like to see also accounted for in another basement. Yeah. This is, is how our utilities yes. are cost a lot more. Okay. Yeah, I, if, if you can, I mean, it, it adds up. Toilet flushes add up. So if you went through and found all the, the older toilets and replaced them, I mean, the new bowls look identical. They just use less water. Um, and so. We can kind of try to get a count of the old bowls. Okay. But when you're saying settle on the stand, what would you say is replace all the toilets? No, you have different bottles. Okay. So you have Sloan, you have American Standard, you have different, and, and a flush valve, you have the high flush and low, you have just a mix of stuff. Okay. And I mean, ideally, if you're doing a renovation, you want to put everything into low flush and you want to flush. But, but my understanding was that you want to settle on your your choice yes. to you and yes. as you need to replace yes you, you use, use same one model. standard right you, don't you use a buy whatever model comes one to mind at the time it's right. not that they all need to be replaced and made correct. uniform that's correct i just when you when you you you, you interpreted my bad english purpose that's well, it part of the problem was the new sections which are now 20 years old were spec a different brand right. than i typically would buy yeah. And that's then you're just stuck with what you got. I'm not attacking you. Just no, so I know. I'm, I'm just not, saying that's, that's kind of why. That's how it happens. Yeah, uh, I, I know. I get it. Right. 
And besides that, you put it in for five years and then something else right. shiny and new comes along and then you're, you're right. using that instead. The, the automatic, you have some automatic flush, um, the electric flush. You know, I've had um, bad experiences with those. Um, and, um, you know, I've had, we put them in schools, brand new school building, put them in, a year later we get the phone call back, we want these out. Yeah. And they want to go back to the hand flush because, you know, they, they just don't work or kids play around with them and they're just constantly running or there's some, so they prefer the, a lot of people prefer the hand. Well, this tries kids out too. Yes. <laughs> yes, it does. It's a so, anyway. Um, handicap toilets. Um, so we had a big debate in my office yesterday afternoon about handicap toilets. And um, we looked at a lot of pictures and it's debatable whether or not you are compliant with the handicap toilet code. Mike would probably be able to do it better than me. He's more familiar, I'm sure, with the, the I think there's probably not a single in condition that is completely compliant. I think you have pieces and parts, but to me, there's there's not one location in either building that there is a completely compliant handicapped toilet room. And I think that's probably a priority that, that it's corrected. But that's got the right handle, paint bars, that's at the right elevation, the toilet's at the right elevation, that the sink's correct, that the sink has the right um, handles on it, that the sink faucets the right length that the wheelchair can get underneath it that you know a person can maneuver um, there are some that are close but if you've ever been in a wheelchair you know because of an accident or an injury hoisting yourself up on a handicapped toilet where you don't have bars on either side is very difficult and um, if you're a little kid in a wheelchair getting up on a, on a adult size handicapped toilet is probably impossible so unless he's you know super strong or she's super strong it's just, I think, something that should be addressed. I don't think you need, and you would know better again than me how many you need, but I think if you had one bathroom in each school that was compliant, that would be a huge start. And, you know, so anyway, that's my handicap toilet soapbox. Um, so uh, I guess that, that brings me back to the new addition. I mean, those were spec'd as handicap accessible yeah. restaurants. Yeah. And so they're not anymore. I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. so. I think they may have been at the time. Yeah. It's been a while. The codes improved, and um, I don't think so. We again, like I said, we had a debate in my office. We had four plumbing engineers and me arguing about what's what. And we had you know, we're, we we've got a uh, hospital, a children's hospital, we're working on right now. And, uh, they have a standard for children's handicapped toilets that is not necessarily code. It's a standard they have because they have children in wheelchairs that need to go into a handicapped toilet. And so we've been debating, do we we'll try to apply that to a K through three? Do you put that kind of toilet in? I don't know if you have kids in wheelchairs or if that's a, but it's not, the, the only code requirement is it's an adult size. And again, in a, in a K through three year, little kids not going to be able to do it. So anyway, I think it, there's a, there's a concern. Yeah, it, it just seems like you're, you're kind of chasing your tail because in five years you put them in, and in five years they could be, you could be out of code again. Right. Right. That is true. You got any thoughts on that, Mike? Uh, no, other than um, I believe when I can't remember the year the first. It came out like it was. It's been amended. Yes. Again, like, you know, 2008 was amended. 2010 was amended. Right. So uh, the the 2002 edition would likely have been in a an earlier version of ADA, and there could be some updates. Um, the the sinks again. Um, my request would be that for your advantage to settle on a standard. Um, certainly, settle on a settle on a faucet or trim standard. Uh, between uh, all the little faucets that don't have wings don't comply with anything. I mean, put them in your home. Those totally are, you know, you need wings, right? You need to have the ears, if you will, or whatever they what you call them. Bones. And then the spout has to come. You can, you can do one lever, right? Like a kitchen faucet, the single lever is acceptable. Or the hot and cold have to have 
um, have to have extensions on. Um, but um, I think, and a lot of times what we're doing is we're putting handicap trim on every sink because non handicap people can use it just fine and it works just fine. It's actually kind of better if you've got big hands and kind of taller. Um, but you can't go the other way. So we're kind of doing that. That's everybody gets a handicap uh, on the passage. <coughs> um, under sink, uh, there's, uh, I didn't see any conditions where I felt that the wheelchair rules were, were there where the, the wheelchair could roll under a sink or a kid could reach into a, into a sink and get close enough. Um, I didn't see any of the long bowls or the, the long reach uh, faucets. Um, there are no anti scald mixing valves. So that's. So I ask about that. Um, we, I don't know that we have the water set high enough. That and, and your next piece that it takes a long time. It takes a long time to get there. I, I, I get it. I don't think you have a hazard. I, I, I get what, I yeah. just want to clarify if you were saying, if you think, oh my gosh, the children are going to get scalded. Well, if they ever got, got hot water, that might be the case. But I, I we timed it, and I think it was at two minutes. Yeah. So yeah. there ain't no kid in there waiting two minutes for water. Well, you know, if they wash their hands at all. The other part of that is the lagging point of water is 140 degrees. What's our? The liming point the liming, of water. Okay, well, yeah. in Yellow Springs, water is very harsh. Okay. So we were very careful to keep our water heaters turned as low as we could yeah. to protect from that. Right. right. Yeah. Typically, they're set at 108 or 106 or something, which is still kind of warm, but it won't scald you. Yeah. Um, the code is that you have a mixing valve underneath the sink. Each faucet's got its own mixing valve and hot water goes in and that mixing valve dispenses water. And in theory, if you've got a hot water system with a circulation pump and you're not three miles away with a water tank, you should wait wait less than 30 seconds for hot water. That's the, that's the there's no code that says you it's gotta be there in 30 seconds, but that's the standard that we try to design thir less than 30 seconds. Um, but yeah, I agree with you. I don't think you're scalding anybody. I just, again, observe, I observed it. Hot water takes a long time. Um, you got a mix of water heaters. I highly recommend those electric, those, anything electric you have in your building is killing you. Your, your electric bill um, could be significantly reduced by if you, if you used a high efficiency water heater. That's like the perfect application for the condensing um, you know, a uh, condensing uh, gas system is a water heater. Um, really easy to vent, it's sealed combustion, you don't have to use any room air, and uh, a lot of them have 10 year warranties, so you put it in, you install, and they're, they're not cheap, but they last a long time and they are very efficient, and it's by far the least costly way to make water, hot water. Um, so I would recommend. The, the, the water heaters I saw that were gas, the venting was questionable with a long way. The plastic vents on a high efficiency water heater can go right out the wall and it's pretty simple. Um, so anyway, I'm, I was concerned about it. And the electric water heaters are just running the bill up with that. I think the problem we had was that, because I know you, the one you're talking about specifically is in the beginning and there's no gas over there. Yeah, okay. Kind of way, the way, why they did what they did. Okay. Yeah, I was curious if they, they didn't run gas in that. They did not run gas in that building. Now, you could probably get it off the roof because when they yeah. put the new addition on, they of course, all the gas is up on the roof, right. and you could probably tap off of that now. Right. But at that time, okay. Again, I'm not attacking. No, I know. I'm just I'm giving you the history so you here. understand it. <laughs> okay. Um, there's one more thing that I want yes, to say yeah. before we move on to the next. I think in your report you, you mentioned several times that there were not enough uh, women's uh, yes. toilet picture. That's, that is not really showing sure Yeah, I'm here. sorry. That, so I, I just didn't put that in here. Yeah, yeah, I wanted to clarify it because it didn't. So there's a new code that, it's not that new, but it's relatively new, that dictates how many um, toilets for women, for, you know, and you, have, you don't have enough. How so far are we? You're a long way from the community. I don't know, I didn't do the, we just did a, a 
Somebody gave me the number of children in the room in the building. We guessed on faculty and staff, and um, it didn't appear. I, I don't think you have enough boys' toilets either, but they tend to be less of a problem. Than, do you have a long wait for kids when they go to the bathroom? Girls, they have a long the wait. The middle school and high school, yeah. yes. Yeah. And the reason and for I'm asking you. You probably have a third of what you need. I, I can do the math on it. We'll give you the quantity that you should have, and then we can. So we're having a third of what we need. And the reason for which I'm asking is because some of the pricing you're going to give later is contingent of whether or not we are doing a major renovation and triggering extra costs like yeah. the sprinkler system. So this is why I wanted to have some numbers here. Correct. Okay. Fair enough. I will. I will give you an exact count and. Um, there were more bathrooms. There were more. Yeah, and they were <laughs> shut off for some reason. Oh, really? Some years yeah. back. Yes. Back. Yeah, there was one on the second floor of the high school, and there was another. Oh, yeah, one I saw that on the, on the first floor months. of the high school, kind of between. I don't know what's there anymore. Uh, maybe the band room or <coughs> Spanish. Like room down from the band room, like used to be Spanish. the room, yeah. or whatever that is. There yeah. used to be a, a restrooms there also. Okay. And, uh, were they single stalls or no. big restrooms? The ones no, in the big. tower were single stalls, right? What? No. In the on the second floor, there was I don't know how many. Uh, what did they do with the space? Floor. Turned it into a classroom. Uh, why did they? Why did they? Well, there was two. There was two. There was two reasons. One, they needed the space, and two, they ended up having to lock the doors on the bathroom bathroom because they were getting destroyed. So the kids would tear them up, so they'd go up and lock them. So they decided after a while that these are locked anyway, we might as well take them out. So they wanted the space, so we made it into a, uh, it was a small classroom, but it was a like, special needs classroom. Okay. Um, sorry about that. I should have put that in there. But this is just a summary. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, the water fountains, uh, the new type you have um, are great. Um, we typically uh, we're, are only putting in bottle fillers with the handicap pipe fountain. We don't put the second one in. So you have two and then the bottle filler. Um, and what we're seeing is most people use bottle filler. Um, it's very rare if you see people out of fountain drinking or they're using them. If it is a, a, a bubbler, they got their bottle there and they're using the, the bubbler to fill the bottle up. So uh, the bottle fillers are. I think that's that. Mechanical. Okay, boilers. Um, so those boilers in the high school are really inefficient. And uh, the, the, the manufacturer claims, if you go back and read his, his material on that boiler, you know, at its best day it was 82% efficient. I don't think they're anywhere close to that now. Um, plus, it's using so much combustion air in that mechanical room. Does the, do the dampers, do the louvers work? I don't think they work. Yeah, I didn't think they worked. I couldn't get them. Done. So that means it's sucking air out of the building into the basement. Into the so you're heating the air, distributing it to the building, and then you're sucking it back out and and putting it through the furnace or the boiler. And you're putting a lot of air through the boiler. If you do the math on how much air goes through that boiler, it's a lot. And I don't know how that boiler is controlled. We think we kind of got an idea by looking at the controls, but um, is it is it you need two on a cold day, and then the third's redundant? Well, they yeah they cycle them in at different temperatures, so okay. when it gets to a down to a certain temperature, the second one. Do gets. all three of them ever run at the same time? Yes. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we didn't do it load calculation, but um, if all three are running, you are really pulling a lot of air out of the building. So it's inefficient both from the perspective of gas consumption and it's inefficient in the, in the, from the perspective that you're, you're pulling all this heated air that you just paid to heat back into the, into the boiler room and up the flue. So it's, um, you know, what we, what we, again, this is another thing to debate. Uh, the the 85 percent uh, combustion if it, if that's not the highest efficiency boilers um, will last 50 years cast iron maybe longer and they're very low maintenance and very low but you should have a sealed combustion so you're pulling air directly from the outside and you're venting back into the outside 
Um, if you want with if you want with a higher efficiency boiler, um, a condensing boiler, um, they're they're awesome. They're very efficient, uh, but they're temperamental. And your your mechanic, your 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 facilities guy, your mechanic would have to train them how to how to tune it. They're just kind of a pain in the butt. Every time we put them in, the maintenance guy who's been used to working on these old cast iron or marine tube boilers now is dealing with this, you know, he can't necessarily see the flame. He's looking at controls and he's looking at numbers and he's trying to tweak it to make it work and it can be a little pain in the butt. So we've been kind of going back to some of the uh, lower efficiency boilers that seem to work really well and you're giving up maybe a few percent. In, in a, with a condensing boiler and in a really cold day, it's not working efficiently anyway. It's it's only working at 88 or 86 percent because it's running as hard as it can on a really cold day. So we would go back with two boilers, and we would have the boiler sized for about 65 to 75 percent of the maximum load, so that 90 percent of the time only one boiler is running. And then on a cold day, the second boiler kicks on. We'd also recommend a turn down so that the boiler on a you know, kind of a cold morning, but a warm day, it can run at a very high, uh, really, you know, low level and be very efficient. So uh, those boilers are inefficient. It's costing you at least 30 to 40 percent more gas than you should. And uh, if you if you get if you could pull the air out of the outside, you would save again there too. Uh, the pumping system is just done. It's old. I, it's not bad, but there's no VFDs. There's no variable frequency drives controlling the pumps. So they're just running at full speed, um, or not at all. So it's either all on or not at all. Um, they're pretty worn out. Um, I always recommend a, a, a skid. They sell them as a skid package, primary and secondary pumps. And um, they're, they're all controlled by a, a VFD, and it probably saves you 50% of the energy in the, in the pumps that you have. Um, you said you, you would recommend two boilers sized so are you sizing them higher so that there's space if it's a really cold day or did I understand? I would what would we do is we'd size the boiler. So let's say you're your uh, heating uh, worst case is three million BTUs. The coldest day of the year uh, is three million BTUs just for the sake of it. I would size one boiler to be like two million or two point two million BTUs. So because the worst days are 10 days a year, right? When you look at the, 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 the typical uh, uh, information about temperatures, it's always in the middle of the night, no one's here, so it's two in the morning, and it's like 10 days a year. Other than that, you don't really have those cold days. So 95% of the time, one boiler would be able to handle the whole school. And then that way you cycle. One day it's A, one day it's B, so you don't wear out any given boiler. So you, you have the ability to just run one or the other. And then if you have the cold day, the second boiler kicks on, and they both run at like 65%. So that they're not, neither of them are running as hard as they have to. When a boiler's running at full boil, at full burn, it's inefficient. They're designed to run, you know, somewhere less than that. Um, and that's the most efficient, so. I have heard that the real high efficiencies don't last as long. That's true. They only go maybe 10, 12 years. So you're paying a lot of money for a high efficiency boiler that's only 5% more efficient, and then you're replacing them every 10 years. And how long do the like, Oh, uh, 50. A cast iron boiler that, um, so the lock and bars that you have in the middle school are in Mills Lawn. It's a great boiler. They still make that exact model. And that boiler is a high efficient boiler. It's got a five X turn down, and you know you can buy that boiler in the size you want, and that thing's gonna, that thing will last, you know, 30, 40 years. And they make they make better ones than that. Lock and bars now got a full line, obviously. But, um, I like cast iron boilers. They're really very robust. And again, you know, some engineers are we want the highest efficiency we can put in a building. So we have a debate in our office on a regular basis about boilers. Um, if they outlaw gas, then we, we, we have to come up with another method. Um, electric is just way too expensive. But, um, so um, let's see, water treatment. Uh, do you water, do you treat the water? The boiler water? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, used to. Used to. Yeah. Um, I don't know now, I, I can't. Yeah, we used to last week. 
there's a pod feeder. Is that what that is? That's yes. connected. Okay. Okay. Um, I did see it. I, I we didn't test obviously. Do you test the water? Do you have a chemical? I, I had a chemical test kit that we use. And, okay. And, uh, so once a year or whatever, I go down there and test and make sure what I'm getting. Okay. So we met last week, Craig said that there was a kind of thing yeah. that you just oh, that's some that's retreating. That's yeah. Correct. You take send it to a lab or something. I'm not sure. Bring somebody in. Oh, okay. Okay. I can give you the list of who comes in. Yeah. I, it's, I, it's, especially if you have water that has lime, yeah. it is critical that you treat your boiling water um, and that um, any new water that's added gets treated before it, uh, it gets into the system or as it's in the system. Um, if you put in a new boiler, I would say you could abandon or demo that existing flue, and that would give you a lot of room. And, and it's kind of runs down the hallway. No. No? No. That's, what is that? That's, <laughs> it's just a cover. It's a cover? It's a cover that covers uh, piping for the hot water heat. Oh. System. Okay. So there's pipes that run up there, okay. and that's just a, a cover. Totally. Just put it in. Cool it's, it's, yeah, okay. it's just a visual yeah. thing. Okay. So okay. The, the flue is, is a, a, a brick chimney that goes up through the three stories. So it goes in that wall and then turns right in and goes into the side of the chimney? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, the chimney, you could run a high efficiency boiler into the chimney. If you put in a, um, you know, a, a non condensing boiler that's close to condensing, by the time the flue gases get out of the chimney, it's condensing. So you could end up destroying your chimney, right? So is it lined? Is the chimney lined? Uh, I, I can't imagine it. No. Is. It's not. Okay. No. So that's a consideration. If you can find a way to get directly outside of the building, that's probably better. If you're using a condensing boiler. Yes, if you're using a condensing boiler. Correct. Correct. I'm not anti-condensing boiler, but there's, they are, they are <coughs> temperamental and they're expensive and they do not last as long. Um, so, uh, let's see, water, oh, new venting system. Um, I'm going to talk about that. Uh, and then re-insulating the pipes. Um, I think there's, a, there's a lot of bare pipe. There's a lot of insulation that is loose. It's not. Um, it's there, but it's loose. It's come loose, and that's really not insulating the pipe. So I think at some point, an insulation package is a good idea. Obviously, if you do a renovation, everything gets insulated. Um, we now jacket everything um, because you know con contractors climb around on that stuff. They step on the the insulation and smash it. That doesn't work. So we've been uh, more and more jacketing the pipe so that it's a little more resilient. Um, it's not going to ever be, you know so good you can climb on it. But, uh, and I did see some places where it looked like contractors were climbing on your your insulation. So. Uh, unit ventilators. Okay, so you have unit ventilators everywhere. Unit ventilators are still very common. They're, they're, we install, we, we design and install them in classrooms and K-12 schools to this day. Um, they've come a long way. A lot of unit ventilators you can use for air conditioning and for heat. Uh, and there's numerous ways to use them for air conditioning. So it, it is an idea, if you want to talk about it, to use the, the, the existing cabinets, put a new, put new guts in it. The existing cabinet, you know, you don't have to modify the room at all. It's the, the guts go into the wall of, uh, of the existing cabinet. Or you can replace the cabinet with a similar, um, with a similar looking unit ventilator. Now, unit ventilators, I'm talking about those things along, along with the room along the classroom walls and heat cool the classroom or heat the classroom. Um, there are a number of ways to air condition a space using a unit ventilator. One of the things you can do is have a, uh, a, a water cool heat pump. So the unit ventilator has a little compressor. It's got uh, the refrigeration cycle in it. And instead of using air as its media, it uses water. You use the two pipe system that in the winter you use for heating and cooling. You circulate water, and it's a um, uh, water source heat pump. Very effective, very quiet. Um, sounds like a refrigerator when it's running, other than the fans. And it will cool a room effectively. Um, also, you can do a DX system. You need to put a little outdoor unit on the roof, um, or right outside of the building, like those little uh, um, 
these little Sandio systems you have or something, but that's another option. It's a little louder, but that also is an option. And the more chilled water is another option. That's by far the lowest cost in energy, but it's the highest cost in installation is the chilled water system. Is there, go ahead. Does it provide enough air turnover in the room? Yes. Oh, yeah. No, you'd have to modify. You'd have to have fresh air, right? You know, so each each of those unit ventilators is on an exterior wall. So you'd have to cut out a section of brick and put a louver and a sleeve in there, and then it would pull fresh air in. But you size the unit ventilator for the room, and you can easily. I mean, there's universities that use that unit ventilators, or that, and they last literally forever. <laughs> Sir. On those unit ventilators, is that the type of system where it's, it's cooling, but it's not really pulling any moisture out of the air in the room? Um, if it's got an air conditioning system, it'll dehumidify. There's a condensing tray in there, and it will also dribble the water directly outside onto the grass um, as an option as well. So, yeah, we the ones you have now are heat only, I think. You don't have any air conditioning ones, do you? I've just been in university. We had a, a cooling system that didn't take any moisture out. And when it's cold, when it's cold in the summer and it's humid in the building, oh, it's, so it's, it's like awesome. a cave. It's, yeah. where'd you get? Where? Uh, Northern Illinois. Okay. okay. Yeah, that, I've seen those. They don't do an effective job of removing moisture. Um, anyway, um, if you don't want to use those as air conditioning, um, the ones you have can be refurbished. You can put new motors in them. You can put some high efficiency DC motors in them, you can replace the, the fans. Um, you know, at a minimum, you need to go through and replace the controls and the control valve and um, clean the coils. I think the coils that I saw look great. Um, but, uh, you know, it could be, they could be continued to be used. And, uh, like I said, they last, they're really pretty simple machines. It's a hot water coil and a fan. But since we have a heat problem, since a lot of the staff and the students are reporting feeling extremely hot, then we wouldn't be able, even if we were refurbishing them, we wouldn't be able to. Yeah, we could control the temperature better with a better control In system. the summer? That's, oh, yeah. That was my question, yeah. control. Oh, yeah. Because the yeah. control, the we'll, pneumatic control, I mean. We'll go into a school on, not, when's the other, when's the tour? Tomorrow? Yeah. There. There's one tomorrow. And then the ones I'm participating in, we'll go into a school that has brand new unit ventilators and um, you can control it. And, and the other one has got refurbished. And you can control with good control with the DDC control system, you can control the unit. You can use them to cool? Well, you have to have some kind of air conditioning system. Okay. Yeah. But, but you can control the temperature. Yes, we, we don't have I'm that sorry, I yeah. misunderstood. <laughs> I thought you were saying it's overheating. Yeah, no, no. In the heating mode. No, no it's, it's, it's it's the the rooms that don't have existing. I got you. Yeah, I got you. Now, obviously, you have to have a thermostat that works. Period. In every room. But if you use a system where you're you're heating with the water during the heating season, and then you're running cooler water through that you can extract water. Yeah. for the cooling, you have to switch one day. You right. can't go back it's and forth. It, it, Unless you put another set of pipes in, it's a right. two-pipe system. So Xavier University is a two-pipe campus. In the summer, they run chilled water, and in the winter, they run hot water. Yeah, I'm just saying, there's going to be and somebody doesn't pick month. the right day in the fall or the spring. Right. Well, they typically be shut some... it down for a month. Cold. Yeah, in, in the fall, they shut it down for a month. They go from air conditioning to heating, and for a month, everybody shivers or sweats. Mm -hmm. And in the spring, they do the same thing. And, <laughs> Sorry. Why are they shutting? Well, because it's a it's a two pipe, so it's a supply and return, and you can either run hot water in the supply and return or chilled water in the supply and return. Um, a, a lot of buildings so have a so four that, pipe. So right that transition. Yeah, the shoulder seasons in the fall and the spring. It's cold and then it gets cold. Yeah, it's cold in the morning. It's hot in the afternoon. Okay. A lot of buildings, new buildings, run uh, four pipes. So you have a heating and cooling system that are completely separate, and you can literally heat one side of the building and cool the other side of the building. And that's kind of how it's done today for modern buildings. But there's a lot of buildings are two pipe, and you can you can use that. Uh, but to your point, you got to pick a day. Halloween is a common day to go from heating to cooling, and you know that's the day or that month of October, or from cooling to heat. 
right? And and Easter is the other one. Yeah. So they no, I just just want to make sure that people understand yeah. that it, if you have a, a two pipe system, you won't have the perfect temperature during those transitions. Shoulder, that's true. Shoulder. Mike, it, shoulder it sounds like you've given us multiple options here for heating and for cooling, right? Um, at some point, are we going to get to some comparisons of what these sure. costs? I mean, I'm trying to keep a running tab here just of things. So I, I'm curious to know how much money would be going into fixing part of something, I guess. Right. And my caveat on using the two-pipe system for heating and cooling is the condition of the pipes. They're old. Again, you can, we can take a coupon out of a few sections and take them to a lab and they can mic them and they can come back and say, yeah, it's fine. And most of the time, we get good results, even on old copper. Is it copper or steel? No, I think it's all steel. It's all steel. Yeah. Okay. Um, there are some clever ways. I've seen uh, buildings uh, refurbished with uh, X, which is a plastic pipe for, for hot water and chilled water. Um, very, very cost effective, low labor. But I'm actually, I, was, I take it back. I think uh, Mills Lawn maybe copper. I saw copper. Maybe Mills Lawn is copper in the high school. I see. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes Sorry. you transition from steel to copper at two inch, so it runs around in a bigger pipe of steel, yeah. and then it taps off at two inch and below, or below two inches of copper. Um, yeah. So, uh, doctor, I can give you kind of a menu, it's, it, it, I'm hoping to get some guidance here. I don't know if the, the, you know, maybe we narrow it down to three or four systems. Well, I guess I'm coming at this in just terms of total cost, yeah. you know. To fix this component is half a million dollars. To fix this component is a yeah. million and a half dollars. To fix this is five million dollars. Well, in the end, when you add it all up, it's a lot of money. we have to think, of, think long and hard about some things. So that's why I'm asking. My, my inclination is to assume that at some point there's a renovation, not a new building, and I want to use what you have to your best advantage. So if you have pipes, you have unit ventilators, that would make sense. It'd be the lowest cost way to go back and give you air conditioning and heating. Um, there are some compromises, obviously. Uh, but to me, that would be the lowest cost way to do it. Not cheap by any means, but it would be less expensive than you know tearing it all out and doing a, a VAE system. Over. And, and I guess what I'm asking is, I know you said there's a you're making the assumption there's not an ability. I have to answer to lots of folks who requested that. So yeah. what they want to see is what's the cost differential between a new build and a renovated. So this is why I'm gotcha. asking okay. these, these questions. Okay. Okay. Mike, with the two pipe, uh, you'd be adding a chiller to the central plant. Um, no, I would do uh, well. That's an option. A chilled water, a chiller plant, and then you run chilled water. Right. Um, and again, that's probably the most energy efficient, uh, but it's expensive. The chilled okay. plant. The other option is a uh, water source heat pump, where there's a little okay. compressor on each one of those unit ventilators in the classroom. And it's, you know, it's a little bigger than a refrigerator compressor. It's very quiet. And it's producing um, the air conditioning. Yeah. And then in the winter, you go to the hot water plant, which would be more efficient. Um, with any any one of these options, there's pros and cons. Yes. The con of that is now you've got 80 individual compressors <coughs> all, over the building. all over the building that you have to repair, fix, Correct. find parts for. You got it. Um, that, that's what goes through my mind. There's, there's two things I, I think about. One is, say you're going to uh, upgrade the boilers, then you have to do them all at once. You can't do you can't do one old one and one new one. They need to be that. All right. So that's a, a, a big expense. That. On the other hand, the unit uh, heaters can be done one at a time. True. Or two at a time, or ten at a time, or, you, or whatever. Yeah. They, they, it doesn't. It isn't as disruptive, or the bill doesn't all come at once. Correct. And so both true. those factors have to be considered. And then finally, when you talk about what you're going to do, is also the life expect expectancy, as you pointed out. 
it's no good to get something that, oh, we can fix it right now with our budget, and it only lasts five years. Um, that's so true. I, I, and that's the worst option is to fix it now and then waste, because you're wasting money. And generally, the fix it now is the least of the energy efficiency. So. Um, so anyway, the, the, the unit ventilators, I think, is, a, is a, always an interesting topic, um, whether you keep them or, or you replace them. The, the manufacturer of your old unit ventilators is still in business. They still sell parts. Um, we, we, buy, we inspect them on a regular basis, so um, they're there. Um, and there's always new ones, right? Daikin makes a unit ventilator. Everybody makes a unit ventilator. Um, radiant heaters, um, you know, you got the cabinet heaters with just hot water. Um, you know, I kind of like a fan. Um, I think uh, there's some of these cabinet radiant heaters that we could ret you could retrofit with a fan in it. It would be more effective and also it would be better controlled. You wouldn't have this overheated space or no heat at all. Um, the baseboard heaters look pretty beat up. I mean, they've been beat up and stepped on and crunched. They're probably not very effective. Um, there are some things you can do to mount them a little higher so they don't become, you know, something people kick. Um, and the, the newer ones are efficient, they're taller, uh, there's more coil, and, um, you know, so it might be something to consider. It's, it's kind of an architectural conversation, too, because you now got this bigger cabinet that's halfway up a wall, you know, so, you know, it has to be kind of a... What, you know, what your architect thinks about it. So. And in the main hallway of the high school, it's resting on the half wall, yeah. all the way down the so it ends up becoming a ledge that people sit on. Right, right, which is, you want to avoid that. You don't want people standing on it or sitting on it. Because once they start smashing the coils down, it's no longer effective. So, um, your unit heaters, um, they're all over the place. Um, they're, again, they're not very effective at, at heat. I would uh, replace those with fan coil units with a control. Um, I mean, I think the hot water is the way to go. The hot water system is in everywhere. And hot water is the way to go. It's just these units are old. They're, I mean, they're original, a lot of them. So they just need to be replaced. They're not expensive to replace, but they need to be replaced. Uh, you want Um, okay, the gym air handlers. Do you use those? They get used the only heat source there is. And the gym's not air conditioned, right? Correct. Um, the gym air handlers are, you know, ancient. Um, I don't think you could retrofit them. It's an option, but typically it doesn't work. Um, if you're ever looking to air condition the gym. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, we look. We talked about that at length. Um, there are things you can do. You could potentially put uh, a rooftop unit in. They're, they're, the good news is there's a lot of space that those air handlers take up, and, uh, and they're only six thousand cfm. I think is that right? Do you I know? Don't yeah, I think that's what we determined is they were six or so thousand cfm, and so uh, a six thousand cfm air handlers relatively small um, today uh, with the new fans. So we have plenty of room, but we need to have an air conditioning component. So you have to have a DX unit with a condensing unit outside somewhere, or you have to have chilled water, or you have to have water source heat pump. Same conversation. How do you make the air cold? And, and, but it's, it's, it's reasonable um, to do that. And it's six thousand. I don't think I gave you a price for that, did I? Um, so I'm using $1,500 a ton as just a round figure if you guys are trying to calculate how much an air handler would cost you today. Okay. And that's a little high, um, so it's a conservative number, but air handler prices are nuts. So a 6,000 CFM air handler replacing that is about a 20 2000 dollars $23,000 air handler. Um, now you got to remove the old one, install the new one, and you got to wire it up. So there's labor that goes into that number. But um, 
it's doable. You can air condition the, the, the gym easily enough. Well, that's just the air handler. That's not the condenser. That's well, it would include it. Oh, it would include the yeah. condenser at that point. And we would need two of those. Yeah, you have two units. And uh, yeah, again, we do a load on the on the on the uh, load calculation on the gym. Six thousand CFM is what those air handlers are. I don't know if that's correct. But that 30 tons of cooling in that gym is probably way more than you need. So it may be you need less. I mean, that's a lot of air conditioning for. I mean, how full do you want it to be? You, know? well, you have the problem with gyms is that you pack them full a lot of people yes. for a short time. Yes. And they, it's almost impossible to yes. keep them comfortable. Yeah. You've got to run it about an hour ahead of time. Yeah, you know, you've got to chill it down right. and everybody's cold when they come in and then it warms up. And the other challenge is if it's got a wood floor and you start condensing moisture, you can ruin the floor. Oh, yeah. And so we don't like to put uh, duct work in gyms if we can avoid it because that sweats. Mm -hmm. You know, on that when you, when you turn it on for the first time in the spring, water can condense or you have to insulate the duct work. And so we try to avoid dripping water on a wood floor. So. Um, Oh, okay, so that, that brings up something that maybe is worth talking about because you mentioned that in this building, the gym has the ductwork up on the roof, which is a terrible solution. Okay, so is it, it is. Is a matter of everybody trying to save space? So they're, well, so what's happening? No, the ductwork here is there's, it, they add it on to the gym space. Right. So half of the gym, a third of the gym is the original gym with the original you know, steel uh, support and the right. roof and everything. And then the other yeah. part is new. So yeah. I think they did it that way because they didn't have room to do it internally. Well, they probably the couldn't structure. put that weight on the old roof, so they had to put it on the... Yeah, plus they, there's a big beam that runs across the middle to support yeah. the openness of it. So rooftop units save space. That's why you put them on the roof. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, no one's got to look at the... doesn't take up you know, classrooms, potential classroom space or other things. But you gotta make the roof stronger, right? So it's a compromise there. You're spending more money to make the structure stronger. And in a gym, you, you know, you gotta cool from either side. So you blow air, you know, typically from either side of the gym and then you return it on the other ends, right? So you know, north, south gets the supply, east, west is a return or, or something like that. Um, you know, it's just kind of a, what's the best way? You know, it depends on which way the building's what, turned. How, how is the gym in the high school currently set up? I, I think the two air handlers blow out the end, right? Yeah, yeah, and then the, the return air is in the hallways behind it. Right. Which is kind of counterintuitive to me because yeah. it's just drawing, like, right. around the circles by the stage. So rotation unit. It's a yeah. rotation unit. It's yeah. just... The other part of the issue with that is the, the roof, from my understanding, doesn't have insulation it's on it. Exactly. The protectum deck is, okay. that's it. Yeah. Definitely want to insulate the roof yeah. if you're air conditioning that space. I mean, you have all kinds of issues. Okay. Um, rooftop units. So uh, just at a high level, um, the, the, you, have two, you, you have two kinds, of, you have the smaller ones and bigger ones. Um, if you read my report, the bigger ones cause me more concern because they serve a larger area, and if they fail, it's going to be impossible to get a new one for a long time. If they're not, there are no units on shelves anymore in, in warehouses, so there's no, uh, <coughs> you know, off-the-shelf air handling units. Anymore. They're all gone. And a new air handler would potentially take 30 weeks, um, depending on how big. So if one of those air handlers, if you have a serious problem with it, um, you're either going to pony up a lot of money to make a, a repair on a 25-year-old air handler that's shot, um, or you're going to have no heating or cooling in that space. So it's really a terrible so my recommendation is you guys, while they're still running, you plan for replacing them. Um, and you plan it in the near future. You know, I don't know if it's, there's enough time, if you ordered it now, that you'd have it next summer. I know it's ridiculous. It's only a 15-ton unit, but they're really, the 
supply chains all goofed up. So um, if you're going to do it, you got to do it when school's out, and you need normally do those kinds of things in the summer. So if you're going to replace it, plan it for either the summer of 24. You know, it can be we can check to see if it's available. So, something could be available in 23, but typically the new unit is heavier and is slightly different size than the old unit, so you gotta fix the curb, you gotta repair the roof around the curb, you gotta, you know, get a crane to take the old unit off, put the new unit on. It's not a real simple, you know, it's not like you're changing the oil. So it's something I think you should think about and plan for because those units are gonna fail and you're gonna be you're gonna be forced to put in a brand new compressor in a 25 year old unit or a brand new condenser coil that's just going to be very expensive. So, um, and I make that comment for all the units that are 15 tons and the units that's 25 or the 12 and a half ton. Um, the little units, the four tons and three tons, they're still around. You can buy, um, you know, relatively short order. You can get a four ton rooftop unit um, and have it out here pretty quickly. So, uh, they're not, but for whatever reason, the supply chain is pretty good. Though. And again, I quoted prices in here. What I, what I'm told, is a conservative number of fifteen hundred dollars a ton. Um, I also mentioned that you should buy the units without controls, so that you can put a, your own control on them. And that's another thing: is the control system is an easy, uh, in my mind, an easy decision to make because it will pay itself back in a relatively short amount of time. And um, cost of it will be reimbursed by the savings and energy. It's just a, a kind of a no-brainer. And when you buy an air handling unit, you buy no controls on it, and then your controls contractor puts his package on it, and then it works with your system. So you don't have, you know, you know, a, a foreign product that doesn't talk to your control system. So that's a pretty standard strategy. Um, so, rooftop one, it's five year old. It's um, it, it should be replaced in the next five years. Um, it is uh, beyond its useful life. It still seems to work. You could probably get an exact similar product that would probably fit right on that curb and match up pretty good on the ductwork. Um, and I think nine to ten grand is is pretty close for the equipment, and you probably double it for the installation. I don't know, MSD does a lot of your work. Do you guys have a fairly, <coughs> fairly good relationship with them? Yeah, I mean, you know, they have different different arms. And yeah. I mean, we have a good relationship with them when they when we can get them out here. Yeah. I and mean, that was a discussion just today. Okay. So so for all the uh, RTUs, the fifteen of them, we're looking at 229k times two. Probably. So half a million dollars for the RTUs. Just, just at, and just at, just at uh, the middle right. school high school. Right. Plus the 350 for the, um, I'm jumping in at the middle. The controls? The VRF. Oh, yes. You are jumping in. Yep, sorry. Okay, sure. it's a problem. So, um, why don't you go to the next page? So again, rooftop four, similar to rooftop two. Uh, that is something I think you ought to replace sooner rather than later. Rooftop five is in the same boat. Rooftop six is in the same boat. Um, I would replace the big ones first. Those are the ones that, if you buy a new one, it's going to be the most efficient. It's going to you're going to get the most energy savings, um, and you're going to uh, prevent yourself from having a section of the school that doesn't have heat. Um, so that would be my strategy. And if they do fail, it's going to be the most expensive one to repair. So. And, and Mike, are all of them, how many of those are heating only versus heating and cooling ventilation? Um, they all, the only one that's not heating is that Goodman, I think. It's, the Goodman's not connected, the gas furnace is not connected on it. And then the Bryant, I'm not sure. The Bryant, I think, is cooling. Cooling that's the one of the offices. Yeah. And but that's, the three ton. I regret that decision. 
<laughs> so scroll to the next page. You have um, five heat pumps. Rooftop 10, or 6, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. And they all have strip heat. And that strip heat is eating your lunch. You are spending an insane amount of money on electricity. Again, I'm, I don't know actually if the strip heat's even used, but I'm assuming in my, in my spreadsheet, I have no choice but to assume it is. And it's being used at a certain amount of hours every day in the winter. Uh, not made it maybe every day. And, and I would love to talk about my assumption. If my assumption's incorrect, I want to correct it. I want to give you the best information. I did tell you, I would tell you this, that when I did all my electricity calculations and went back and checked it against your bill, I'm almost right on your bill. So you're talking about I got the McKinney left. rooftop units? Sorry? Specifically the Those train on top of the McKinney heat building. pumps. Yeah. They're heat pumps and they have a, a electric four. Five pump. of them have 14 kW strip meters and one's got an 18 kW strip meter. And that's just, you're paying. So that's you know, the only you know, source of heat in those. In those well, it's a heat pump, so it should yeah. heat a little bit, but at 45 well, degrees. Depends how, how efficient of a heat pump It's no is. good, right. right. So I have a question, I see that you're recommending replacement within one year. Within well, I think you should get rid of those immediately. immediately. I think you should, okay. I mean, you run gas to them by, by gas electric, I'm sorry, the gas pack um, rooftop units and replace those immediately. So you say replace immediately within two to three years, five years, and what is the That's lead one time? Year uh, yes, but I was looking at the ones above. Okay. Uh, so all of them have some of them immediately, all of them within five years. What is the lead time on getting for the big ones, uh, we'd have to check, but right now, um, there's 20 to 30 weeks. Okay. But in, in something that you wrote in the report, too, is that some of them have 60 to 80 weeks. Oh, uh, that's the electrical gear. The electrical to replace gear. the electrical gear. That old electrical jumping way ahead, that old Frankenstein-looking thing you have down there. Um, if you wanted to replace that, you would have to wait almost two years. Okay. The units, the five or six rooftop uh, heat pumps, um, uh, you're paying five, six, seven thousand dollars a year in electricity for those. If I'm doing my math, which is nuts. So the sooner you get those off your roof and get gas units up there, you're you're going to save. You know, in in five years, you'll save uh, three hundred thousand dollars. Maybe more, just because of your the electricity. You're paying an insane amount of money for your electricity. Um, you're, you're, again, I, I took the I took the electrical information I got, and and you got you got a bunch of uh, fees and tariffs and things like that on it, demand charges. So I just put it all in there and divided it by um, the, the consumption, and it's like. 15 cents a kilowatt, 15, almost 16 cents a kilowatt. So that's theft. Your electrical utility is stealing from you. I think. I mean, it's a village. It's a village. <laughs> they need to. Two and a half times, I think. No, that was water. Two and a half times. What is the water? Our next quote is two and a half times. 16 cents a kilowatt is a lot, a lot of money for our electricity. Uh, so, anyway. But so like if the, if the master planning process were to say, hey, let's tear that McKinney, let's tear that addition down and replace with a new addition, yeah. then we wouldn't be replacing it. Yes. I, yes. I'm, I'm sorry. I kind of went in with the assumption of the, that we're um, doing a renovation per yeah. se. And, and I understand practice. you're trying to compare new to renovate. Um, so I was kind of focused on if you had to renovate, not that you are going to renovate. You had to renovate, but even even irrespective of the renovate or not renovate, these units are killing you. And I'm I almost got sick when I did the math. I, I, again, I might be doing the math incorrectly in terms of my assumptions on how often the electric strip heats on. But in the winter, if it gets cold, that strip heats on 16 hours a day, and that is a lot of you know every day. So I'm assuming four months 
out of the year that he systems on and it's not anyway. It's I'm happy to, to, to make it last. Um, all right, what else? DRF. So the DRF system, as far as I can tell, it's not functioning or it's not functioning very well. And um, there are some very good DRF systems out there. And if you want to stay with DRF, I would highly recommend you go with the Mitsubishi or a Daikin. And yes, they're expensive, but they're they're better today than they were 10 years ago. You got a generation one or one and a half DRF system. You guys were one of the first, I must have been one of the first users of the what DRF is, what system. Is DRF? Um, the variable refrigerant flow, it's that Dyke, uh, LG, those two white big LG condensing units are out, um, out on the lawn. Um, they, uh, it's a, um, a system that uses the refrigeration, the, the natural inclination for refrigeration, um, heating and cooling, using it to, when you have a, you know, when you cool it in a room, there's hot refrigerant gas somewhere else in the system. Um, this system takes advantage of that and can shift hot or cool refrigerant to various places. A very efficient system, a highly efficient system, and some of the best energy efficiency you can get on an electrical system. It's a heat pump, uh, but the one you have doesn't work. So you either have to replace it, you have to replace it with something. And you can replace it with uh, rooftop units and, and go back to kind of a similar VAV system like you have and elsewhere in the building, or you can replace it with the DRF system directly. And I'm sure, am I stressing you out with all this money? <laughs> no, all right. What well, part of the building does the DRF serve? It's the, the, tower. the tower and the, li the cafeteria. The tower and, and the, the library. center and the, yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, there's kind of a mix of systems in some places. There's yeah. I just, one of the things I wondered about is why there needs to be supplemental heat in parts of the building that already have the hot water heating. Well, I think it's for the air conditioning. It's aspect. just for the air conditioning. Yeah. Even though it's a unit that can do both. To do both, yes. And it's effective down to very cold temperatures. The new stuff uh, that Tsubishi makes is uh, heats, gives you full capacity heating down to minus 10. So it's a great system and very efficient. Um, and Daikin, again, is a similar uh, product to the Mitsubishi. And anyway, we specify those a lot. A, a lot. The, um, the, where you have them, I think, is a pretty good application. So I don't, I don't mind the application. I think whoever designed it was right on. I just think that system was the first generation, and it's just not working very well. The other thing you have to get with the good VR system is a good installer. So. The Mitsubishi and the, the, the Daikin, they give you a 10-year warranty. It should last 20 years, um, but they only give you a 10-year warranty if you use somebody that was trained by their installation team on how to install it. And then they inspect it before they you know, uh, turn it on, and then they'll come out, Mitsubishi or Daikin will come out and turn it on and make sure it works properly. So if you're going to do it, I, I know it's 250 to 350,000. It is an expensive system. Um, it does save energy. And if you're paying 15 cents a kilowatt, we can do the math on it and, and give you a recommendation on which which is your best option in terms of uh, total life cycle cost. I probably can give that to you pretty quickly off the Mike, spring. You replace that. that one for one. You got to strip and replace all the refrigerant piping. Yeah, it's all of this stuff. All yeah. Yeah. And is there like a DOAS unit? For fresh air attached to Yes, the there is. You have to have a DOAS unit, a dedicated hot repair system, um, to bring in fresh air. Absolutely. And is there one of those today, or how they? I get don't it? think so. So they're not getting no, fresh air today. No. There's. Is there? It seems to me like there's uh, maybe four inch ducts running outside from every unit. Okay, so there, but there's not a dedicated uh, rooftop unit that's exchanging. Air, so there's you know what I'm saying. It's an energy. Now energy these are just per, or a, They're exchanging per classroom. Yeah. Okay. And so you're getting book. fresh air through the cassette. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So you're probably getting some. The the rules today for fresh air are significantly different. They're you know expecting you know 15 
CFM per student. Um, it's a pretty impressive amount of fresh air. You have so, to so we, are we at the point where we need heat exchangers? Oh yeah, we that's, yeah. yeah. The DOAS unit is a heat exchanger, so it's got either a, a box where cold air goes in one direction, outside air goes in one direction, the uh, return the rejected, you know. So or it's it a but, wheel. But these these systems we're talking about are all just taking outside air and they're not treating it. Well, they they can. They can. Yeah. They can. Yeah. So I'm asking was they You can't just dump 20 degree air in the building. Right? That would be be a lot of unhappy kids. So you have to temper it somehow. Right. So yeah, it's. Um, but your point, you have to have that right now. So, Michael. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, how much longer? I'm just kind of watching the time. I, don't, I have. No, I have I, all night. You have all night. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, how many more? My goals are you guys out. I'm sorry. What's no, no, it, no. This this is is more slides. Actually, or, you know, so there's so two good. more slides. Oh, and you're, this you're, never, yeah, I just, so okay. you, you get through the I'm other one. I mean, over, there's I'm not. Close, a, I no, no, it's been great. Mills Lawn is is all. In much of your report is identical to yes, high school. That's true. You yeah, are correct. Maybe maybe we need to finish the middle school and then we yeah. can get to the so, I think we're almost to the last slide. Yeah. Anyway, there's options on on replacing that ERF system. Um, it would be smart, I think, to look at two or three option two options in and uh ERF replacement, just so you have a sense of what's the best way to do it. Um, Cost-wise and life cycle-wise. So want to go to the next slide. Um, controls again. Controls. It, it, controls would be something I think you want to. You might want to consider if you do a uh, energy um, pro project. You bring in an ESCO. Um, that would pay back quickly, um, but it's very commonly done on an ESCO kind of basis. Electrical. Um, I recommend you upgrade any panel that's older than 2002. Um, we again, we had a big debate over the 208 volt versus 480. Um, there is no way going to 480 pays for itself in any lifetime uh, unless you're doing a new building. So keep the 208. You know, I think some of the equipment single phase. It ought to be a three phase. Everything should be three phase. It's over a certain horsepower, um, but. Like those heat pumps are all single phase. I would make those all three phase. And, but the 208 is here to stay. There's really nothing you can do. Um, and it's not really causing you a penalty. It's just over time, the equipment manufacturers are slowly not making it. Didn't you then, say at some point we're going to be required to? Upgrade? Yes. Well, if you ever do a new building, if you do a renovation. But I mean, not, not that the village is going to come through and upgrade. The utility it's companies. It's force us to upgrade. So I would question why. You'll be long retired. Yeah, but what, what about my kids? <laughs> if, if you do a renovation and you get, if you retire, well, unless you do a renovation or if you do a renovation or a new building, the utility will come and say, can we change it to 480? Because we don't want to give you 280 anymore. Can we change it to 480? We will, if we're your engineer, we're going to say yes. And, you know, they give you the transformer, but then you have all new gear. You have the, the that's the time to do it. Is if you're, free? they'll give you the transformer for free. Yeah, they own it. They set it out there on the curb. You, you don't own your transformer, do you? I know. Uh, the high school ones, I'm thinking. It's yours? I, we'd have to check the paperwork on that. You don't want to know, because if it fails, then you got to go find a new one, and that's 80 weeks. Well, there was a, there was a discussion about it when, okay. the, when the addition was put on, and I don't remember what the outcome was. I seem to remember that we did but that, okay that maybe you do i i didn't know that okay yeah so, so anyway answered my question because okay. i remember reading that yes and um so you know i just don't i can't make a pencil where it's worth it so now the gear needs to be upgraded that old gear is going to fail and you know we debated whether or not we should even recommend in your in your maintenance plan to exercise it like trip it and so normally once a year you go through and you exercise all your switch gear, you move all the levers, you, know, you de-energize it so it's not turning lights on or off, but you lubricate and you, you, you make everything work and make sure it works. If you exercise that old gear, you may not get it to reset. So we're not going to exercise. Or you're going to have a good fire. Did you ever do that? No. So you've never had a time. That's like 
flushing an old engine is what you're saying. Yeah. It's a bad idea to the flush an old transmission. Yeah. The flush an old transmission yeah. says you're just putting all the crap in your system. And that's the 80 to 88 week lead time. Sorry? That's the 80 to 88 week lead time? Yes. So if you want a new set of gear, you need to get, an elect get it designed, get an electrician. You really don't need a design. You need an electrician to order it and get it manufactured and then start in summer or a shutdown period. It's not a lot of work to replace it, but they got to have it. What's the cost? Yeah, what's the cost? I put it in, the, in here. It's in here. It's not that bad. It's, um, I think, the 20 grand. How much per month? The, the, the little panels, the little panels are a couple thousand plus a couple thousand to install. Um, the big expensive stuff is the the ancient one. Second, sorry. Um, um, so the sixteen hundred switch is new or newer. I don't need to mess with that. It's the uh, it's the uh, in this building. It's the eight hundred amp distribution panel and a Mills Lawn it's the secondary distribution panel. So it, it, all these there's a bunch of old um, uh, so distribution. Is that the one for fifty five thousand? Let's see here. Uh, we're talking about high school middle school. Okay, we're looking at how much I'm just about that other thing. <laughs> so the the uh, eight hundred amp distribution panel that's original to the building I'm suggesting you probably could get for 20 grand. But you gotta wait a year and a half. Two years. Two years. You get it. So the panel the little panels, the small distribution panels that are hundred amps or whatever, um, you got eleven of those and um, total they're fifty five thousand. That's a total. So there are the small one, plus the twenty for a big one. Yeah. So we're at seventy five without labor. Year and two years. No, that includes that would include labor. So it's so replacing the small ones is mostly labor. Mostly labor, yes. And you can do that relatively quick. The small panels are available. So yeah, if you wanted to replace all your small panels, you could go out and get them and replace. But that that old one, no, you're going to have to buy that, order it, and now, you know, do any of the village, any of the village that worked for Siemens? <laughs> they might be able to steal one for you. But anyway, that's um, <laughs> Mike. When you talk about keeping two or eight people, uh, riff on the need for a full electrical service upgrade to the building. Are you saying you don't need to do a full so full service um, upgrade? Well, if you get the panels replaced, your system should be stable indefinitely, right, for the next twenty years. If you get a new, if, if you do a renovation that's so significant that we're now adding power, or we're going to relocate panels. Or, you know, let's say you do nothing, and in two years you do a big renovation. Um, we're going to put panels everywhere, right? They're going to be different panels, we're going to put larger panels, and we would want to use two or four amp. And the utility would want us to use four amp, right? You're going to go from 1200 amps to 1600 amps, say, right? Or, or something. It's going to be a change. And at that point, it would be. For the future of the school, smarter uh, to be in 480 because that's fully supported by manufacturers, fully supported by utilities. That's the power we're using. Right. But if you switch from, from 208 to 480, does every motor in the building have to be replaced? No. 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 So, but most of them would be anyway, right? Because we're replacing, if we, well, we're going to replace if we just, pretty much everything. You know, Got new air handlers because they're not going to last much longer. They and then they're that not compatible with, the, with switching if you over electric. Gear. All new air handlers and they're all 208. Then you don't you committed yourself to 208. Okay, well that that's the point I was making. You could buy transformers that would convert 480 to 208. To 208. But yeah. then you got a bunch of transformers. You got to. It's possible. I would well, see that. That's the, yes. that's the complexity. Yes. Of all of this. Oh yeah. This, we deal with this particularly. All right. But I mean, you know, if you're going to do a renovation, hold out on all these air handlers. Don't do. I, the only air handlers I would recommend you you get rid of are those heat pumps because they're killing you. Um, 
but uh, the rest of it, I would ride it out until you did the renovation and then convert everything to Ford. Everything. All motors. Okay, then. But in my mind, one of the goals is not to have to do everything at once. Okay. If you're doing it incrementally, then you're probably committed to 208 for the long term. For the long term. You could transform it. Yeah. That's an option. We could do that. Okay. That's an and, option. And are we hamstringing ourselves by, by limiting our choices of equipment to 208 equipment because it's going to be less supported in the yes, future? Yes, you are. Over time, you are hamstringing yourselves. In the next, in 20 years, it will probably be no longer offer. I'm, I don't know. It's going, it's going well, to know, make... It was just like getting all these air handlers in 2001 that had R22 refrigerator exactly. in them. All right. And we're, and we're screwed. You are. It's true. Okay. I didn't even talk about the refrigerator, but I don't know what you're paying, but I bet it's a lot. R22. Like, Can we move no. on to... Yes, ma'am. I just, yes, I just want to make sure we have some scope of okay. both buildings. Sure. Um, the, the fire alarm is the only other thing, is, and we did investigate the fire alarm. I talked to Biederman. I know what your system is now. Your system is fine unless you do a renovation, then you've got to bring it up to compliance. So Yellow Spring, uh, so we can, you can go to the, okay. yeah. Um, again, same story, fire protection, sprinkler system. A little less, it's a little less square footage. I think I use 50,000 square feet, so it's a little less expensive. But you got the same issues: tap, new tap fee, a fire pump, and a meter pit. So if you, if you do a renovation, you have to do that. Next slide. Uh, plumbing. Again, you have an existing water system. This system seems to be in a little better condition, at least what I can see. Um, I, you know, that, that backflow preventer and the meters, okay. I, I basically say in here, you've got 10 years. Um, I don't think it's going to freeze or fail. The one that's in the ground is harder to tell what's going on. Sanitary system, it appears to be the very similar cast iron, uh, as is the storm. Um, in both cases, I would recommend you camera it and see what kind of condition it's in. Um, I didn't talk about the lightning protection. The, there's a lot of lightning protection. Do you guys get struck by lightning a lot up here? Or is there a special? What happened? I, Why I will tell you that we had a long discussion about this, and maybe Craig Conrad can answer because Craig Carter said that has been on the roofs for years. Yeah. Years. The uh, lightning, lightning protection? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I couldn't tell you what year they put that on. Oh, probably. Um, when they did the 2002. Did you get struck by lightning? I don't know why they spec it. I, I, I wasn't a big fan I'm, of it. But, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I think you should have it. I think what's up there is insane overkill. You should have some. Yeah, um, but what's there is nuts. And they got it tied to the baskets, the strainers. Yeah, I read that. And it's destroying yeah, the strainers. That's why yes, that's why. We so, did not do that. The roofers. Oh, well, I am not attacking you, Doctor. Even if you did it, I would. Yeah. No, okay. well, the original installation, that's the way they installed it. Yes. I guess then, that's what I mean. Right. Yeah. But, yeah, but, but you know, what they, they should have done is, yeah. So today, they put it in the rebar, <coughs> in the, the footer. And, or they drive a copper bar deep into the ground, or they tie it to your water. Those are the three ways. I would recommend you do it. And, you know, not the way it's done. But, so if you put a new rooftop units on, let's not do that. That would be a mistake. So again, um, roof drains, drain bodies. If you're going to replace the roof, those definitely should be replaced. Um, and then disconnect all that copper if you can. So next slide. Um, again, same thing with the urinals and the toilets and the sinks and the, and the uh, handicapped toilets. Um, I'd recommend you find uh, a space and renovate one space to be a handicap of completely uh, compliant with 2022 um, code, um, set along standards for flush valves and faucets. So, so at the high school and middle school, you said that we have maybe a third of the toilets that we needed. What about the Same thing. I, I guess I, I do have some questions about that. The, um, the number I have for toilets per person, or however you want, person, one toilet, for 15 people, correct? Oh, do you? Is, do you have that many toilets? 
Well, well, no, no, I'm saying... What's the code? The code is one one toilet for 15 people. I, there's a, it's, it's a table, but yeah, let's go with that for now. But, so the stadium's a little different. Yeah, I... Okay, it depends on the use. Um, so one and, toilet, then there, and then no more than one third of your boys' toilets can be urinals. Um, but I, I get that as we need about 27 toilets per building. And so, I, I mean, to me, it, it seems like we, we do have... Okay. Uh, we did the math on it and came up with a different number on how many you have. But I, well, I, can I, I was just using the, the numbers from the, the spreadsheet. spreadsheet. The reality of it is we do not have okay. enough no. toilets. I will okay. get back to you on that. I will for do I okay. have a quantity? Um well I mean there's there's the quantity on the, the spreadsheets and I have thirty I, I have twenty five toilets and seven urinals at the high school middle school for a total of thirty two and twenty five toilets and nine urinals at MLS for a total of thirty four. Is that kind of student and teacher access? Because some of those are accessible to the kids. Yeah, um, I am not going down by like Okay, access. I will, I'm I will confirm that. Building. It's possible we screwed that up, but I'll confirm it. I, uh, when we did the initial calculate count, we came back with insufficient toilets. But maybe you're right. It's, it's, um, I think the why it's relevant for me is to know whether or not we have a design issue that we cannot renovate away and we need to supplement with an addition. Okay. So, yeah. Anyway. So, we can move on. Okay. Uh, okay. You can get a next slide. Again, this under. This is high school. Oh. Yeah. This should be Mills Lawn. And it, follow, but it follows the nails on the sides. I took that, I didn't take the header off. Oh, okay. So, yeah, because I was at 17, so it was 18, supposed to Yeah, I just didn't take the header okay. off when I was So basically, what you're saying is the plumbing, yes, the urinals, the toilets, all the sinks, all the sinks, all the sinks, yeah. follow the same pattern. Yeah, the only thing that I would add in this is you have these sump pumps. Um, and they're, um, my recommendation is uh, that you put new hardware in. Some of the hardware looks uh, pretty shaky. Um, and um, typically you want to you want to have those powered by a generator or some kind of uh, backup power in the event that you lose your power. Is there a rain, a rainstorm, a thunderstorm? Um, those are keeping your building dry or the space drive, you want to be able to pump it when you lose power. So there's ways to do that without a generator. The generator is typically how you do it. It doesn't have to be a huge generator, it just has to be a generator. They're not keeping everything dry. Right. Yeah, I don't agree with that. Um, so, and they're, you know, they need to have covers on them there. So that would be the only other comment on that. And what are you saying about exactly what part is illegal? Saying here, this is illegal. What's illegal? Oh, the dumping of water. Oh, where the water? Oh, yes. Going. The yeah. It's uh, from the building. Since side. it's in the yep. building, it technically has to go to the sanitary mm -hmm. versus the storm. Yep. And I believe it's going to the storm. Except that our village has been telling us all along that we can't dump it into the sanitary. <laughs> yes, the village probably doesn't know the code, but the code's very specific. So if it's inside the footprint of the building. It could potentially get cross contaminated with sanitary, and therefore it's got to go in the sink. So, and I've had that argument with plumbers. Plumbers make the same mistake. So, so next slide. Um, it, illegal is the wrong word. It sounds like someone's going to come in and arrest you. For yeah. Pumping it in. It's, it's going to make so you shut it off. What's the correct word? Uh, not code compliant. Do I use the word illegal? Yes. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. It's not Just making sure no one's coming in the rest of the principal, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's You're an English teacher too, right? So, <laughs> sorry. Uh, boilers in the middle school are obsolete. 
um, and inefficient, but they're not horrible. Um, I would say that those locker bars are in better shape than the uh, Kelly Patterson. I, you know, I think if you replace those in the next five or so years, you're okay. Those those have sealed combustion. You're getting air out of the um, from the outside, right? They have an yeah. in, inlet and a so, so you're not using a building air for combustion right there. Um, so those are better units. They have a turn down. And again, they still make those units. So if you did lose one of those units, you could replace it with a, a very similar, if not exact, same prop model as what's there. Um, uh, again, the pumps, uh, I would replace the pumps with a pump package and put VFD variable frequency drive controls on it so the pumps can operate at a lower RPM. So if you only need 10 gallons uh, uh, a minute, you run the pumps slow. If you need 100 gallons a minute, you run them faster, but you're not running the pumps at uh, high speed all the time. Um, water treatment is a must. I think you're doing it. Um, so on the existing venting, I would, if, again, if you're, if you're going back with a 80% efficient, I would probably vent it the same way it's vented now. If you're going with a 90% efficient boiler, I would vent it differently. Um, uh, so um, again, pipe needs to be insulated. That's not insulated. Um, and I would do that after you replace the pump package by the pump system. Uh, unit vents, same conversation with the, that we had before with the unit ventilators. How do you want to air condition the space? There's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, you can heat pump, you can chill water, uh, or you can use the EX system. Um, uh, those unit ventilators are, you know, I have, what I would recommend is you assume $10,000 per class for a new unit ventilator, and it's probably close to that for the installation. So. $20,000 per classroom um, is a good estimate. Um, I don't think the window units are doing, the window air conditioning units are doing anything. Um, do they work at all? I mean, cooling the room? Uh, no. No. <laughs> so it's loud and annoying. Loud. If you're standing next to it, it feels good. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. They're like between a half ton and um, three-eighths or five-eighths of a ton, right? It's 8,000 BTU and 6,000 BTU. If you run it overnight, it come in. It's, it's cool limit. It's cooler, yeah. right, but it's also night, so it'd probably be cooler anyway. So. Um, yeah, so I don't think they're doing much. Um, they are using a lot of electricity, but I don't think they're doing much. So $20,000 for classroom, for meals on this is a half a million dollars. Well, I said 24, 24 rooms. It's 24 rooms. I, I just. Yeah. It's probably relatively close. It's okay. about a half a million dollars. Sounds good. Uh, heaters, same thing as before. You have um, cabinets and you have baseboard. Um, I would put fans in all the cabinets to make them more efficient and then rethink where the baseboards or the, the other ones go to, to be uh, a little less in the way, get their kicking them or, or uh, Next slide. Um, rooftop unit one and two, um, those are big units, 40 tons each. Um, those are definitely on your long lead item list. Uh, both of those are well over 25 years old or 24 years old. Um, and I would say that they're both pretty much done. Um, if you have any, if you lose the board on one, it's over with. I don't know if you have a spare board. Did you guys buy boards? Yeah. You have spare boards? We're saying they can't be that old. They were put up in 2001. No, they were put in 98, I think. Well, they're 1998 vintage. Vintage? Okay. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the rating plate. They were manufactured in 1998. Okay, but that, that yeah, they, when they, they were, were put in 2001? Yeah, well, that okay. last new institution. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So it's not a big difference, but it's a difference. The, the one looks like it's in particularly bad shape, um, more so than the other. But they're both the same. They're sisters. They're almost the same unit. Um, so again, 
it, if you order it today, we'll have it for a year. So it'll be a year older. And there are 22 units. Do they leak? Do you have a lot of leaks? Uh, the, the gym unit we did not. Uh, the other one we found the leak for a really long time. Um, I think we finally got it, but no, not a lot of leaks. At least not. Ten years ago. And the the the, the other units a VAV system, right? You have VAV, yes. Yeah. Yes. And those are all 20 years old as well. Yes. Just, and they're, are they hot? Are they reheat? Do they have a reheat? They are tapped into the boiler. Yeah, so they're hot yes. water reheat. Yes. Okay. That's why I would just, I would go back with that. That's yeah. good system and good good use and good control. Um, it is an option to replace those units with VRF. The, there is a VRF. That's a pretty good application for the VRF or a VRF system if you wanted to do do that. It would be more expensive probably at the end of the day than. Um, going back with rooftop units. Um, the, the VAV boxes are about two grand um, with controls, or about 1,600 without controls. Um, so <clears throat> you'd have to replace those. I think what, there's 19 of them. I don't remember. Really. So, um, window units, like I said, replace those. 100% replace your control. Now, the control front end, when did that go in? Like 2017? That uh, the the graphic user in uh, no, that was before that. Was it? Uh, it was before 2012. Okay, so you probably isn't probably not upgradable. So I didn't know. It was how. with that. It was the Whitewall project. Yeah, the Whitewall, yeah. which was yeah. uh, 10, 2010. 10, probably. Yeah, 2010. Not right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So if you put in a new, and, and they are, they're a good company. They have. Uh, open protocol equipment that it would be less expensive and anybody could work on it. So you wouldn't be married to that. Um, but uh, again, I think a control system would be a no-brainer. Um, on the electrical side, replace all the panels that are over that are older than 2002. Again, I think you're married to the 208 unless you do a full renovation. And the fire alarm there is also non-compliant. It's not voice enunciated um, and the units are not addressing the devices aren't addressing them. so those if you do a renovation you would have to replace those <clears throat> I do have some questions yes so here in the recommendations that you made you made recommendations for the minimum that we need to do to keep a school running right because you keep saying that if this is you not doing a renovation but what if we want to do or what if we need to do renovation I'm asking this because I still can't figure out whether or not we should switch to 480 volts or to wait before we invest how many million dollars into new RTUs and boilers and so forth. So how are you going to deliver recommendation for that? Um, in the spreadsheet, um, I'm assuming all the equipment's going to be replaced in five years. So if you look at... That's what I saw too. Yeah, yeah. so, I, and I can make that two years or three years or ten years. Right? It's easy to change that, but my assumption is that in five years you're going to do a, between now and five years from now you're going to do a complete renovation, and virtually everything in the building is going to be replaced. You're going to basically keep the, the structure the and the shell. You're going to replace windows. You're going to replace everything that you can replace and bring it back up to like new condition, uh, similar to what you walk through next week or two weeks from now. That was my assumption. And so my pricing will be based on that. The pricing will be based, based on everything being replaced in five years. So if we can talk about the spreadsheet, I'm, I'm sorry that most of the committee members didn't get it because we got it ourselves. I'm sorry, I apologize for, it's uh, not for lack of working on it. <laughs> yeah, but, but so. Yes. Um, so one of the questions that I had is that in there you have a column for a replacement cost. Yes. And I wanted to ask you, is it replacement with low efficiency or high efficiency? Which scenario did you go I'm replacing with? it with with like for like if I can buy like for like. Like for like, but not an upgrade that would. Well, in some cases, I can't buy an old inefficient product anymore. I got to give you what's what's available, and that's what I based it on. If if um, you know, like toilets, like for like, right? Uh -huh. It's 
depends so on the I, I would, you know, if we take toilet, I would be interested in those rocks that we replace with something that can be compatible with the low flush. Yes. Because Everything, you can't buy a hot, you can't buy a wasteful toilet. It's all going to be. And so, I, and I think that last time we talked about this, I was asking for different scenarios. One that, that would be like for like. One that would be what if we were upgrading to something that would be more manageable and would cost us less long term. Sure. <laughs> and uh, so would efficient. you be able would yeah. you be able to highlight those two different scenarios in your replacement cost here? Sure. Because I was gonna say here. Um, so in some cases in the replacement cost, I've given you a total. If you oh, if you go to the cell, you put your cursor over the cell, it'll tell you the math and how I arrived at it. So all those cells are Uh, yeah, before I, well, I was going to say, I'm assuming once, I mean, the, the building envelope is missing. Correct. Is there anything else? Yeah, security, okay. um, furnishings, roof. Uh, finishes. Roof. Uh, roof. Yeah. Yeah. roof. Yeah, the envelope being the walls, the windows, the roof, the doors, um, you know, the envelope of the building, the skin of the building. Um, that's all missing. And they did a walkthrough Monday. Um, I owe you your security, uh, which we collected information on that yesterday. Uh, I owe you your uh, handicap accessible, um, which we collected yesterday. I owe you um, the uh, IT. Um, I need to have a conversation with your IT guy to you. So once I read through everything, I'm going to give you a call. And we can, um, and then uh, the furniture, loose, loose furnishings, and then finishes. And I have to have a conversation with Mike on both of those. Because I'm not a furniture finishing guy, so I'm going to have to you know, help me a little bit. Um, if I give you some square footages, or you tell me what you think, then I will plug that in. Is that it? Is there anything else? I think that was it. I think that was it. So the slides will be on the. Uh, the slides are, are on board docs. Yeah. 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 It just it came late and yeah, I don't know. There will be an update. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming there's probably at least two more revisions of the report and at least two more revisions of it. Yeah, so some yeah. pictures that were similar in both reports, which doesn't mean that it's to be uh, identified. Um, I wanted to ask you about the database. You have two columns. One of them says routine maintenance per year, and then you have something to say the annual repair maintenance cost. Yeah, so. Routine maintenance is, again, I don't know if you're doing it. I'm not judging you if you're not doing it. But it's maintenance that the manufacturer says you should do. Okay. So you should, every quarter or every year or every some interval, clean your light fixtures, right? Okay. Um, you should go back and relamp every so often, right? So I'm putting in those, those maintenance things, the hours and the cost of a person yeah. and materials that they might need. Um, to do the maintenance, and then on the repair, I'm making a guess based on um, the age of the equipment and the complexity of the equipment uh, on how often it'll break down and how expensive that repair will be. Okay. So uh, there's, a, there's an industry calculation I'm using in there based on the, the the age of the equipment, so it's 1% for every year. Yeah. So if a piece of equipment is 20 years old, I'm using 20% of the replacement cost as the um, uh, cost of a re major repair. Okay. So some equipment, you have a minor repair, it's something electrical or something simple, small. In some cases, it may be a compressor. So, and I have discounted that for some of this equipment that's 50 years old, or otherwise, it would be $50,000 a year, I'm telling you, you're gonna do repair. And I have no idea if that's, you have a total on how much you're spending a year on repairs. So, it depends on what you're talking about, HVAC? Yeah. Um, I think HVAC is only around like $25,000 a year, and that includes maintenance and repairs. Um, okay. And so based on, on your numbers here, just the annual cost of repair and maintenance for the system that you identified, that comes up to $460,000 per year for the school district, and this doesn't include the envelope, the security, the furnishing, Correct. the accessibility, the IT and finishes. Right. So that I'm is, making assumptions yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand. on that. We can go to zero. I, you know, no, 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 because you don't do it doesn't mean you shouldn't. No, no, no. 
No, I think that where I'm trying to get at is I'm trying to understand if we repair and maintain what we have right now, how do we pay for this and how much does it cost per year and what I'm looking at. Oh, is okay. is, is, so this is where it gives me your idea is that it would cost us about four hundred sixty-five thousand dollars per year. Well, because it's old. If because it's new, it's, it's under warranty and it costs less. And, and I, I would argue that there's not many school districts that can do the tape of repair and maintenance that you're saying. Right. It's deferred. One hundred percent agree. We well, don't have that. P and G doesn't money. do it, and so again, that's one of my assumptions. I can I can throw all that back if, if you no, want I, me to throw no, that back. No, I I just want to make a public statement. It's it, this is it. right. I agree with you. Very There's very few, few if any entities that do, do all the maintenance correct. that you're supposed to because do. Because that would come up what problems? General. General uh, operating. General? Well, yeah. Um, way unless more you have a a, a permanent improvement fund that is large enough to cover all of that, so but even like perm that. It really shouldn't even be permanent improvement because maintaining what you have is not an improvement. Yeah. A permanent improvement is something that lasts five years or more. So, so general fund, so general fund for operating, it, it would be it would be maintenance. Um, and then, if you are in a, a, you know, if you go through an OFCC project, you have a um, mm -hmm. there is a maintenance fund. Yeah, so thirty four. Yes. Right. But, we haven't done one of those projects. There's no O34 fund here. It's and then a major catastrophic. When you do a maintenance O34s are, I mean, they're designed to keep your building as it was when it right. was new, but even those are rarely enough to cover all things, like your O34 isn't going to cover your roof or your parking lots, typically, because these are major expenses. And it, your O34 is like, OK, it, you know, we're going to re-carpet this hallway or um, HVAC means right. or filters. So I think um, that I would be interested to see how you think that it fits in our finances. You know, how much how much money do we have right now to do those things? And how much, how does it compare to this? I think this is the information that I would want to see if it's something to, to do. Um, okay. I guess I'll, I'll need more clarification. Yeah, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Just because we have those numbers now. I just wanted to remind us that the committee was charged with providing the community with a full picture of the cost, scope, disruption that may cause, be caused by renovations and timelines for renovation projects so they can informally compare a permanent improvement plan at various price points with building new or with a combination of renovation and building new. I just want to keep us remembering what our, what our um, charge is for the school board. Um, it seems to me like, you know, getting, so the next, I'm just trying to think about next steps. Uh, we need to hear about the building, you know, these things that you're still gathering information on. And that will, that, and so I assume we'll be hearing about that at the next meeting. Um, it seems to me another step is you guys, uh, the two mics, we're going to be working together around developing this um, permanent improvement plan, which is a combination of maintenance plan. Uh, your what you're looking at and the needs there, as well as uh, what my yeah, that's, at. that so, is one thing I do owe you. I do owe you a maintenance plan. So what we were going to use is the OFCC maintenance um, calculator that's on Oaks. That's what you do when you build a <coughs> building got a maintenance plan on that. I was going to use that format as your maintenance plan. Again, it's a maintenance plan. So, um, and by the way, I only have 65000 as your routine maintenance. Not, how much did you have? 400 Did you have them added together? Yeah. I have 215 in one and 215 in the other. So and that's, that's in repairs. That's in the, uh, Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyway. I'm trying to find it again. Oh, so, the, um, annual operating costs, I think. This is oh, annual operating costs? Okay. Hang on. Oh, here we go. Annual manual cost. Oh, I don't know. I'm sorry. Okay. I can't read it. Well, yeah. So, he's, there's a, no, I think 
you were looking at column miles. I, I, well. was, I was making. He's, he's looking at column T, the routine maintenance per year, which is 65000 for the high school. Okay. And on the. Um, there's the, no total for the. Yeah, I can totally. It's, uh, so at the next meeting, if you're asking for email information, we wanted to look into ESCOs, um, and I think we should talk to more than, I mean, I think we should get a couple of recommendations and, and talk to a couple of different. What I was going to do is introduce you to a guy who right, formerly worked at the OCC that could explain the process and give you examples of what he's done in other school districts. Uh, in terms Does he of, work with a particular company? Or? Yeah, he has his own company. He's oh, consulted yes. now, okay. but he's done uh, uh, several of these energy projects that fit into the state rules that allow the school district to um, borrow money and do these things to pay for these improvements, and then how they get paid back or how the loan gets paid back, and over what time frame. Maybe something that's interesting to me. Not I don't know. Um, probably, probably the best way for you to learn. About it versus <laughs> should we bring somebody here? It, it, I know it's you going to require a separate meeting. Yeah, so for sure. We, we have had one of these. We have that report from late 2019, early 2020. Um, oh. Didn't qualify. Yes. So I, I why didn't we qualify? It's, it's honestly at five after nine. It's probably <laughs> you something you don't want to get into. Okay. But I, I'd be really curious, Mike, to know to, to talk. Do you know Mike Mendenhall at all? Have you yeah, ever met him? But I think it's a separate meeting because it just you know you have to sit you have to sit with this and you have to understand it and so um, I just want to make sure that you know and, and we should craft a meeting where we can allow for that. Okay. Um, so maybe in November have a second meeting. Would that be Um Maybe. <laughs> we'll talk about it later. <laughs> okay. We, we, will, we will figure it out. I want to say one thing, and I'm sure you do, about the visits tomorrow. Yes. I don't know who's going. Oakwood is 9.30 um, at the meet at the junior high. Um, and then Greenman is 1.30. Meet in the main um, office, and the superintendent will go back us. So. Did you, have you talked to Larry about four stills at all? Um, I did not. Okay. Judith was communicating oh, with you were. Yes. Okay, so you have <laughs> times and dates. I don't have a specific location on the campus, but I know that we're meeting at 9.30 there. Okay. On the 14th, on the 14th of October. Okay. Uh, I need to, he has a reply to my last email asking about where we are actually meeting. Okay. Who's, uh, who's going to the Oakwood tour tomorrow at 9.30? Awesome. Okay. Wow. If you go on the, the Google Drive for this meeting, there's a map that shows with an arrow that points you to the entrance. The southeast corner of the building, there is no parking, so you're going to have to find street parking on an adjacent street and give yourself another five or ten minutes to go. Just to uh, give you a little introduction, so Oakwood was having these same conversations, and there were, at the end of the day, they decided to do a partial roof replacement, left coast service upgrade. Uh, air conditioning system to a, a new VRF system uh, and uh, while they were at that they replaced the ceilings with new lighting and did toilet room renovations so that that's kind of what I would call a partial targeted renovation focused solely on systems yeah, okay. they spent 18 million dollars on that just finished it up uh, they did it while the kids were in the building with no swing space so it would give you a, a visual picture, you know, for good or bad, of, of what a building would look like if you did that kind of investment. Um, what's yes. their school? What's their population? A couple thousand. Money? Huh? I got it. Is that their middle school, high school? Yeah, there's 712 building. Yeah. yeah. Is, you just so just one, seven, twelve. Uh, and, and, oh, in that build, there's, I think there are a couple thousand overall. No, yeah. In that building, they're probably 150 per grade level times five. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, Oakwood has 2,055 students. 
all grades or the, the district, the Oakwood, Oakwood uh, City has 2,055 students. 16 million just for that one building? Yeah, and that building is about the size of Mills Lawn and, and your middle school high school put together. Got it. Okay. Uh, Are there other comments from the committee? Good. Or we have a couple. We have a couple. No, no, I know. Yeah. I was just wanted to check the committee first. Okay. I had one yes. quick question. Yeah. So, um, do we know what date we'll have a side by side of the renovations this is how much it's going to cost versus new building do we have like an ETA on that I'm not doing the new building we're just doing the renovation no. we can well, do a square footage estimate for new building I was going to say I think there you've got some work to do before we can get to that it seems to me uh, but I know you want to know kind of have a, a general idea and some, Michael some what do you think some feedback that would be so at our last meeting, I presented a draft of mm -hmm. a first step to start the conversation. Um, what would be helpful for me would be to get some feedback and direction. Is, is that the right direction? Did I do too much? Did I not do enough? Um, and, and you know, if, if we say as a committee that that's perfect and that's it, um, we can develop a budget based on that. I'm just not certain it is. I don't want to assume that it's the right I'll come plan. with teacher feedback. What's that? I said I'll come with Mills Lawn teacher feedback. Okay. Do we have high school teacher feedback on that? Uh, I can get some. I, I, I mean, I can. Brian, is there high school teacher feedback on it? Um, nothing specific. Uh, there was a couple of people were watching the last meeting and asking a couple of questions. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. I'm going to take about six minutes of your time, and then I'm going to get out of your hair. Thank you for letting me speak. Of course. This is the thing. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
as part of their educational campus. Now, I am known for having a knack for creating theater opportunities out of alternate spaces. I do so because here in this district, it is the option we have. And I and my fellow fellow artistic to create the next generation of world-class performers despite such conditions. Every Ohio Educational Theater Alliance review we receive, and we always go with full offerings to state, we are one of 10 schools in Ohio that does that and is offered that every year. Well, what um, is it? I'm sorry. Ohio Educational Theater Alliance, it's part of the Educational Thespian Association. It is the high school program for scholarships and getting our students out, performing with other thespians. Um, Every review we have received from other school teachers who come to review our shows always has some form of comment about how they simply don't understand how we make such a high standard of performance with such a lack of facilities. Whereas this makes me extremely proud of our students, I have never really felt that as a compliment or a good reflection upon their district. Our lack of dedicated art spaces affects more than outward impressions in our community. The impact is financial as well. Things have changed since the pandemic for theater in America and for our little theater department. Um, spaces formerly available for us, such as Mills Lawn, who now needs the space to take care of their own children and use it for the goings on of an elementary school daily, as well as the founder are no longer available as they were before or are just reopening and have limited availability and additional costs attached. Because of this, Karen Diamond, our theater producer, and myself have been scrambling for spaces for the past two years to perform our fall plays and spring musicals. We have been so grateful to the spaces such as Agraria, where we performed our 2022 State Theater Award winning Talking With in a barn. It was cold. We were also grateful to the Clifton Opera House to host our middle school play, although there was no backstage area and the children sat in the balcony. Even with this generosity, we again faced issues of students needing to use offices for dressing spaces, having inadequate restrooms and facilities for students to prepare pre-show and audiences to use, and little to no backstage areas, not to mention limited capacity ability, which affects our overall, overall bottom line for the theater department. It was stated in the last meeting, any theater the school would require would only require 99 seats. Our current program exceeds this number throughout each night of our runs regularly. Our opening night of Shrek saw 300 people alone. Speaking of musicals, due to the need to account for cast and crew, where we have close to 50 students, as we do with many of our uh, kids in performance, we must consider audience size. So we are now turning to other educational spaces outside our communities for short rentals of their spaces in order to provide an experience comparable to other districts for our young artists and accommodate our audiences. Last year, we rented the Robeson Theater at Central State for four days. Limited time. The cost was $5,000. Thank you, Yellow Springs Community Foundation, for underwriting that for us. This year, our money will go to the John Legend Theater at Springfield High School, where we will get four days of limited evening rehearsal and a weekend run for about $4,300. Now that is not money that is going to the students. That is money going for space rental. It also means families must travel. And dining and entertainment dollars then leave the Yellow Springs community. And I don't understand how anybody on this committee could believe that that is a desirable outcome. It is also really not sustainable long term for our program. Now, I'm also a teacher. So for day-to-day -day facilities, I teach the uh, Yellow Springs High School McKinney Combined Choir. I have close to 40, 40, <clears throat> excuse me, members. 
And I can tell you, as cute as the spaceship is, its acoustics for singing are far from good. And its ventilation is extraordinarily poor, which is something we have to think about in this post-COVID world where we understand that singing is still a risky activity. You heard last month that the room was not ADA compliant. It is not. Access to students with mobility problems or in motorized chairs is neither safe or easy. It was a remark made during that discussion that I watched online to fill in the band room floor with cement to make it ADA compliant. That is one of the reasons that brought me here tonight. As a teacher who works with these young people and wants to support their connection with their own vocal instrument, I found that remark callous, dismissive, and disrespectful. In comparison, right now, the village is tearing out new sidewalks because they did not meet ADA compliance. I think about that action in relation with the remark made here, and in all transparency, it makes me furious. I'm often lauded for the transformation of my performance room into a semblance of a theater space. For the record, it is not. It is, like many spaces in our building, inadequate in ventilation, having no outside windows. For someone with me, with an autoimmune disease, this means there is no fresh air in a room that supports a lot of physical and vocal work. But you heard last time and tonight that many of our spaces are not sufficient. As a member of the middle school team who has hid from the bats in the halls, and it's not cute, it's scary, and it's not healthy, and it frightens the kids. I have sweated in the gym during graduation. I have some form of brown sludge dripping onto my floor after heavy rains, and I've worked in that trailer. I can attest to all these conditions especially in the trailer, which is indeed rife with mold, smell, and collapsing ceilings due to moisture. And I've seen the mold. I'm sure every homeowner in this room would recoil at the idea of black mold or conditions like this in your own home. However, last month remarks were made about why we just couldn't keep the trailer even after recommendations were made by architects and staff as to its terrible condition. The denial of this reality of this real situation is of great concern to me as both a teacher and a former parent whose kids sat in there. The only thing to keep in that trailer based on the evidence that has been shown to this committee at this point is nostalgia and memories. It certainly is not our village children. Which brings me to a question I have for the committee. Why aren't there conversations about what our children in the village deserve instead of what they can live with, tolerate. Where's the real outrage of the heat in the tower and having to travel two floors for a bathroom? <laughs> Where are the conversations that go to what our children need as 21st century students? Times have changed in education. It certainly isn't the same that when I went to school in the 1970s. Where is the service for our children instead of service to our financial Where's the conversation that it is not school levies that break banks, but insane utilities and water costs for residents here in the village? I live seven miles north. I do not pay what you do for water and power. When you have to start community GoFundMes for residents to help with water and power costs, that problem has to be addressed. Likewise, if your children and your grandchildren sit all day in buildings without adequate safety and security, and as I learned tonight, I did not know, we do not have fire protection. That provides a moral imperative to fix that, too. But let's go back to my level of expertise. For the record, what, school, uh, what we need is a school auditorium, which can seat our student body and faculty for school assemblies, graduations, music concerts, theater performances, and community gatherings. It should have good acoustics, a lighting grid, and positions, adequate rehearsal and storage space for both music, theater, and educational events such as exhibition night. This will bring us in line with districts that surround us and allow us to teach 21st century students in a space that supports their learning and leaves them job ready as they go out into the world. 
I want to apologize to my comment to my colleagues. Um, I want to apologize to my colleagues um, for the uh, the length of my statement tonight. It is burned upon me. You all work long, hard days. And in my seven years here, this is the third time we've received this information, and each time it just keeps getting worse. I want to praise also our custodians, because that's the team that keeps us going daily, and they have taken some shade in us. They work hard to keep us open and should be shown respect as they work with the systems at the end of their life cycles, as we heard about tonight. In closing, I respectfully encourage this committee to honor the taxpayer dollars funding these deep dives and accept the results of these experts who have clearly told you things are not sound. From the outside, it sometimes seems to those watching that there is a looking for an answer wanted here instead of looking at the truth in facts. I encourage you to accept the evidence and to put the needs of our magnificent students and village children first. You have heard our spaces and infrastructure are inadequate. Patching them alone is not the answer, and it does not fit the school's needs. The teachers have told you that. Architects have told you that. Please take heed of this and remember that there are real people living with these issues and listening to your responses. Ask yourself, would you be OK in these environments as described? Because if the answer is no, then the committee work focus will be clear, the expense of this committee will be worth it, and we can move ahead united to do the best for our village students. If you would like to discuss theater spaces, if I may be of service, I am at this committee's full disposal. I'm happy to meet with you. Please come see five plays for an anti-racist tomorrow and Peter Pan in November. Peter Pan will be in the gym. Let's all pray for Colvin. Thank you for your time. Okay. So are we all set for what's happening next month and tomorrow morning's visits? And is there anything else to discuss tonight? Uh, yeah, the date. I wanted to Next month, I think I sent an invitation to everybody. It's the third, I think. It's the third of November. Okay. We'll be here. Okay. All right. Well, let's, guys, we'll say let's adjourn the meeting and see some of you tomorrow. Yeah.